Oh, this camper's life is for me. Oh, it's great, isn't it, Miriam? Yes, I guess so. Except, why do we have to camp way out here? There isn't another soul for miles around, probably. Just mountains on every side, and it's so pitch dark. Look, that's the wonderful part about it. No noises, no people. Oh, boy, this is the life. I always say the camping Gary, out... Gary, look! Hmm? Well, hey, you scared me out of a couple oh. of years' growth. But quick, we got to start packing. We're getting back to civilization. <laughs> What's the matter? Oh? <laughs> I suppose you saw two shiny green eyes looking at you out of the darkness. <laughs> we'll have to run for our lives. Yeah. Look, on the top of that highest hill over there, a volcano starting oh, up. <laughs> volcano, what an imagination. All <laughs> right, Marty. But you just look at that glow and see how far those sparks and things are going up in the air. Volcano, oh. it's only somebody's campfire. Volcano, oh, that's rich. <laughs> A short while ago, I thought that was the way it happened myself. I mean that a volcano started at the top of a mountain or hill, but I've just begun to appreciate that they, sometimes at least, start up from flat surfaces and build up their own mountains. But that story belongs to Emerson Markham, our science reporter, who will be our guide on this excursion in science to the lands of our good neighbor, Mexico, and to Mexico's new volcano. Ladies and gentlemen, Emerson Markham. Thank you, Bob Stone, and how do you do, everyone? We're indebted to Dr. Elsie Grattan of the Department of Mining Geology at Harvard University for our information on the new volcano down Mexico way. Well, now that we've minded our manners, I presume it's safe to proceed with our story. Just how unusual is the birth of a new volcano, Emerson? Well, Bob, of the unnumbered thousands of volcanoes occurring upon the face of the Earth, most are presumably extinct. Less than 500 are known to have experienced eruption since the beginning of historic times. And most of these latter represented merely a recurrence of activity at event established long before. And for only a handful of that 500 did the eruption mark the initial outbreak of a brand new volcano. Then whoever saw the beginning of the Mexican volcano we'll be talking about wasn't the first human being to witness the birth of a new volcano? No, Bob. But Dionisio Pulido, the Indian farmer of the little hamlet of Periquitin, 200 miles west of Mexico City, did witness at close range the dramatic beginning of the world's newest one. It must have been dramatic. What happened? Before we get into that, Bob, I'd like to say that Polito's cornfields were hemmed in by several extinct cinder cones and surrounded by old, rough-topped flows of lava. And the soil detailed was partially decomposed volcanic ash, which the surrounding volcanoes had emitted when they had been in eruption not many hundreds of years ago. Many hundreds of years, you say? Then it really wasn't an old story to Polito. I mean, he must have been astounded. What did he see? Well, during February of 1943, the region in which Periquitin is located had been experiencing many local earthquakes of growing intensity and frequency. On Saturday afternoon, the 20th, while Polito was working in his fields, he heard unusually loud subterranean rumblings. Suddenly, in a little sag of the land, there appeared a small crack, from which he saw a thin jet of yellowish dust ascending. As the noise increased, the column grew in size, height, and fury, changing in color as material from the surface soil gave place to fragmental debris torn from the dark rocks lying at a greater depth. Oh, gosh, right in the middle of his cornfield. Did he stick around to see what would happen next? <laughs> no, no, and I don't think you would have either. He hastened in terror to spread the news in the hamlet a mile and a half away. When he and those with him returned in the gathering darkness, they saw red-hot viscous molten lava being hurled by rapidly succeeding explosions high into the air to fall back as solidified fragments and to form a rapidly growing conical pile around the spouting vent. How much of a pile, Emerson? Well, by next morning, the cone of cinder was several hundred feet broad at the base and more than a hundred feet high, Bob. And emerging through a breach at the base, a flow of lava was spreading over the field. No longer was there any room for doubt that here was a new volcano. It took its name from the locality, Periquitin. And up until the time I was talking the matter over with Dr. Grattan, the eruption had continued with scarcely an instant's cessation. Well, that's amazing. Has the eruption continued to be as strong as it was at first? Well, just about the same intensity of total activity has been maintained, but the nature of the activity has varied strikingly from month to month and often from hour to hour. That must be particularly interesting to geologists like Dr. Grattan. Well, what kind of changes were they? While larger masses, bombs, and smaller fragments of lava continued being ejected from the crater with loud explosions every four or five seconds, the lava flow advanced over nearly a square mile of fields. 
But in mid-March it halted, its front still half a mile from the little town. Then something happened, I take it? Yes. Increased activity in the crater vomited upward enormous quantities of fragmented lava as a great black pillar to heights of two to three miles, from which the coarser and middling sizes fell back to build the cone even higher. Smaller fragments ran down as volcanic cinder to inundate the surrounding country, while the finest dust was carried by the shifting winds, some of it reaching as far as Mexico City. And you said Mexico City is 200 miles away. That is remarkable. Did the same sort of thing keep on? No. In mid-April, lava again broke through at another part of the cone's base and flowed for three days, while the yield of ash from the crater diminished and the proportion of bombs increased. Then there was a reversion to the heavy ash stage until mid-June when, for a few days, occurred the most varied and spectacular events yet revealed. What? Something else? Wasn't all that went before enough? <laughs> Evidently not for Perikotine, Bob. In mid-June, there were explosions from the crater and partial undermining of the cone, alternating with great rapid outpouring of lava, one stream of which stopped just short of the first house. Then again came the ashy stage, interrupted by more lava flows in July, August, and September. And never a dull moment, variety all the while. And not very long after, in mid-October to be exact, still another phenomenon appeared, Bob. Down one slope of the cone came a line of protuberances from which very hot lava issued. Most of these minor vents soon subsided, but the lowest one, practically at the base of the main cone, continued in violent eruption and built a considerable cone of its own called Zapicho, the Indian word for little boy. Indeed, at the time I was talking with Dr. Grattan, the principal activity seemed to have shifted to this new parasitic vent. How high is the main cone now? At present, it's about 1,200 feet above the plane on which it started to build, and its base is more than a mile in diameter. Zapicho, still growing, is already nearly 200 feet high. Polito's cornfield must be a total loss, then. Uh, how much other damage has been caused? There has been no loss of human life, either by the advancing lava flows, or by the falling bombs, or by the volcanic gases. The dust-laden atmosphere, though unpleasant to breathe, has not had serious consequences. Nevertheless, the physical damage caused by the volcano is very great, and spreads with each day of continuing activity. Yes, but what kind of damage is it? Nearly all of the tillable land close about the volcano is buried under tens of hundreds of feet of craggy new lava. From there outward, over a circle approaching 20 miles in radius, the newly fallen ash has become so deep as to submerge the springs and all existing crops and fortage. In short, the entire resources of some hundreds of square miles of this agricultural region have been blotted out. And what of the people themselves, Emerson? What did they do? To those worthy natives, their land is everything, you know. And so, despite danger at hand and despair for the future, they stoically clung to their simple homes, clearing off hourly the heavy accumulations of ash from the fragile roofs until, one by one, they collapsed. By midsummer, in order to prevent catastrophe, the government ordered complete evacuation of the hamlet of Perikotine, whose walls are now practically submerged. New lands were allotted some tens of miles away. What do the geologists expect to gain from the study of Perikotine, Emerson? The study of this new volcano is facilitated as never before by the countless advances of modern science. Moreover, most of their studies hitherto have dealt with examples like Vesuvius, already old and vast and highly complex, and therefore extremely difficult of comprehension. And there's an advantage in studying a brand new one? Yes, indeed, a very great advantage. You see, Perikotine started from a known site, and by simple processes in plain view, has already taught us much as to how the still more complicated examples must have grown. Indeed, when Perikotine shall have reached the end of its destined activity and joined the ranks of the world's dead volcanoes, there is good reason to believe that it will have greatly clarified our knowledge of volcanic action. And is that the reason they're investigating it? Not the only reason by any means, Bob. The whole geologic process and the result is a direct consequence of the constitution and the condition inside the globe. Volcanoes afford our most direct connection with the deep interior, and gradually we are gaining from them improved insight into many of our most fundamental geological problems, such as the sources of the heat that makes our planet habitable, the causes of mountains and of ocean deeps, and the origin of metallic ores. Just one more question before we leave Mexico. How long will the new volcano continue to be active? There's no way of predicting the answer to that question with certainty, Bob. Only a guess can be made. Perikotine appears to be repeating very closely the type of behavior observed in the smaller Mexican volcanoes. Its late condition, where activity at the main cone has greatly subsided and action is now chiefly confined to an adjacent satellite, is suggestive that the end may be approaching. 
the accustomed experience with the death of volcanoes does not justify our being over positive. Possibly the recent relatively quiet action is merely a forerunner of a new cycle of eruptive vigor. But bets are probably safer that do not count on long life for pericotine. Well, there's one bet I'd like to make, and that's that some of our listeners would like to have a copy of a scientific paper which contains all the facts we've discussed here, plus many others we haven't had time to mention. The paper was prepared for us by Dr. L. C. Grattan of the Department of Mining Geology at Harvard University. To get your copy, all you have to do is address your request to Excursions in Science in care of the station to which you are now listening, asking for scientific paper number 145, Mexico's New Volcano. That's Mexico's New Volcano, scientific paper number 145. Your copy will be sent along to you free of charge. And now, once again, we've come to that portion of our program regularly devoted to the answering of scientific questions sent in by you listeners. The answers these inquiries receive reflect the latest and most accurate information available since they are based on information supplied by staff members of the General Electric Research Laboratory or of other equally trustworthy institutions. Ready, Emerson? Let's start the ball rolling with this one from a gentleman in Vineland, New Jersey. He'd like to know if it is possible to build a reliable barometer so that he can control the humidity in his cellar. Well, I believe our listener is referring to a hygrometer, which is an apparatus for measuring the degree of moisture of the atmosphere. A barometer is an instrument used for judging probable changes of the weather, isn't it? Yes, it determines atmospheric pressure. Well, do you suppose our friend could make a hygrometer? Well, yes, he might make a very crude one for this particular use. In order to do it, he should have two thermometers, a cup of water, a couple of strips of cloth, say muslin or linen, and a chart which we call a psychrometric table. This equipment can be used for making the so-called wet and dry bulb thermometers. Well, in what order do you put all these various and sundries together? If our friend will simply wrap these strips of cloth around the bulb of one of the thermometers so that one end dips into the cup of water, then by capillary attraction, the cloth will soak up the water and the one bulb will be wet. And by the way, it's necessary to keep air moving over this apparatus when performing this little experiment. He could do that by simply fanning, couldn't he? Yes, he can do that. And observe how the mercury in the wet bulb thermometer drops. He should keep fanning until the thermometer stops dropping. Following this, the temperatures of both thermometers should be read. And by referring to the psychrometric table, our friend can determine the relative humidity. Is the table easy to use, Emerson? Yes, I think so. Let's take a specific example. Suppose the temperature of the dry bulb were 85 degrees Fahrenheit and of the wet bulb, 80 degrees. So, by referring to the table, you'd find that the percentage of relative humidity was 77%. Incidentally, there's another device used for determining humidity which you might make. What is it, Emerson? It's a hair hygrometer. You mean it's possible to determine the relative humidity by using some hair? Well, should it be blonde or brunette? <laughs> well, hygrometer builders, like gentlemen, prefer the blonde. Oh. Although brunette hair will also work. You see, it changes its length with the humidity in the air. It becomes longer when it's humid. How do you use it? Well, the strand of hair should be fastened to some rigid support and the lower end wrapped around a shaft to which a pointer is attached to show the change in length. How do you calibrate it? A wet bulb and dry bulb thermometer can be used for comparison and calibration. Our next question is from a listener who writes, Supposing some water and green vegetables are enclosed within a heavy iron ball. The ball is placed in boiling water. Does the temperature within the ball rise above the boiling point? The boiling water is, incidentally, in an open kettle. No, no, the temperature wouldn't rise above the boiling point of the surrounding water. Whether the pressure within the ball would rise considerably depends on too many factors to be covered in a short answer. Okay. Now, the same listener wonders about great masses of material hurled into the air by anti-aircraft guns. He wonders what becomes of this material as it must return to the Earth somewhere. Doesn't it reach the Earth at high speed and is therefore not a menace to life and property, he asks. Well, there is considerable danger from falling fragments, but they do not fall at high speeds due to the air resistance, you see. They are dangerous, nevertheless. And now I'll have to say thank you, Emerson Markham, and goodbye, everyone, until our next Excursion in Science.